The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. State and local governments across our nation provide a wide range of incentives, tax breaks, and other forms of targeted assistance to specific businesses in the name of economic development. Some of these incentives are specifically designed to encourage entrepreneurship, which economists know is very important for a thriving and growing economy. But not all entrepreneurship is productive. And do we know if state assistance will encourage productive or unproductive entrepreneurship? Are we boosting the prospects for economic growth or entrenching crony capitalism through these subsidies and incentives? Joining me on eConversations today to talk about the, his research on these questions is Dr. John Dove, who is the Manuel H. Johnson Professor of Economics with the Johnson Center. Welcome back to the show, John. Thanks again for having me. Well, Let's just start here with a, a point that uh, I think a, a lot of economists recognize is, is important for a, a thriving economy, and, and that's the whole idea of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so you know, whether it be modern uh, entrepreneurs like uh, Sergey Brin or, or, or Steve Jobs or going back in time to the, the John D. Rockefellers and uh, Andrew Carnegie's, entrepreneurs contribute a lot, but what exactly do they contribute? Yeah, economy. you know, thinking about what entrepreneurship is too, especially, uh, you know, for a lot of economists, it's really sort of a, it's a discovery process. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, what it is, entrepreneurs, you know, they're, they're perceptive individuals, right? Individuals that try to figure out and determine, you know, where is the future headed, right? Where is this uncertain future headed? And really trying to figure out ways to combine scarce resources in meaningful ways, right? Meaningful ways being by, by combining them to produce things that you and I ultimately want. Many times, these are things that you know, we end up wanting that we didn't even know we wanted. Think mm -hmm. Steve Jobs and the iPhone. None of us even knew we wanted an iPhone before he came along and produced and created this thing. But afterwards, right, what that's done is to increase and improve the overall human condition and well-being and, and left all of us better off as a result of that. And, and a number of economists have uh, weighed in and, and helped us understand this uh, role of entrepreneurship in the economy, right? Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, up, up here we have uh, Joseph Schumpeter and uh, Israel Kersner there, uh, two uh, prominent economists that have worked directly with trying to understand what entrepreneurship is, understanding, you know, that discovery process and the role they play and that really, um, you know, w when economists think about entrepreneurship, especially where we are today, is you know understanding and recognizing that entrepreneurs really are drivers behind economic growth and development, and it deals with a lot of the, the new things in, in our economy, it's doing things differently, whether it be just a, a new product or service, or even a new way of organizing a business, right? Exactly, right. Just trying to develop those those new and innovative things, right? Things that hadn't been tried before, and again, things that in many ways, you know. Are, th are things that we didn't even know we wanted to begin with, but that perceptive entrepreneur, that perceptive individual, that entrepreneur uh, goes out and, and takes on those risks to produce those things and to ultimately provide those goods and services that you and I desire. And in so doing, right, we, we ultimately end up um, um, seeing increases in, in wealth and well-being, and that's really the driver behind then economic growth and change. Now, state governments and, and local governments as well have, have been uh, very active over the last few decades, and by all measures, it seems to be increasing uh, o over time in trying to assist business and, and assist in a very uh, targeted type fashion. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of these efforts. Yeah. So again, this is this is something these you know economically targeted investments, economically targeted incentives, and things like that, right? Where we see state and local governments providing you know all sorts of different things, tax breaks, um, you know sometimes outright subsidies, land grants, things like mm -hmm. that, in order to try to incentivize uh, uh, businesses and firms and here manufacturers to to try to locate within a, a given locale, 
right? Again, the, the uh, um, rationale behind that is that in so doing, it will provide job growth and job opportunities and will ultimately spur the economy and, and spur economic growth within that, within that place. Mm -hmm. And as we started to unpack this, uh, there, there's uh, two different types of arguments that sometimes get made as to why like a specific state or a specific city should uh, uh, go ahead and offer these subsidies or, or incentive packages. And uh, so one of it is, uh, is what we refer to as an arms race uh, mm -hmm. argument. So if you could, like, tell us a little bit about what the arms race aspect uh, of in, in development incentives would be. Sure. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, in a way, it's sort of a race to the bottom almost, right? In that, you know, what we have is a situation where states are, state and local governments are expending real resources that could be used for anything else, right? But what they're doing is, is trying to use these resources in order to draw these firms and businesses into their state. The rationale behind that is because, you know, kind of the, the, the game as it stands today is everybody's doing it. Right? And so if your state or local government isn't getting involved in the game, well, you're going to lose out on all these opportunities and these potential benefits. Um, where if nobody did it, well, then what we would see is you know, actual um, um, growth in these entrepreneurial activities and, and, and businesses just occur naturally. But mm -hmm. you know, given that everybody's doing it, it's basically trying to take business away from other states and bring it into your state. And that's, that's ultimately the arms race aspect of it, where everybody's doing this and, and just trying to vie for you know, these businesses. Amazon is a perfect example of that right now where we've seen, what is it, I think literally hundreds of, of cities and, and state governments have gotten in on this trying to get Amazon to locate their new headquarters, you know, within their jurisdiction. And it's a, one, one important thing to uh, emphasize here is that if you're an Alabama leader and, and from this arms rates perspective, you wouldn't necessarily be saying that these uh, targeted incentives or this development policy is something you particularly want to do, but you have to do it just as like if your rival, if our, if the Soviet Union was building um, nuclear stockpiles, we had to respond in kind, or we could be at a disadvantage. Right. That's exactly right. You know, when when Florida or Mississippi or Tennessee offers these incentive packages to these businesses, it puts Alabama at a competitive disadvantage, for better or worse, and. What that means is it's potentially more businesses will flow into those states and it will lead to um, um, uh, less job growth and less job opportunities in the state of Alabama, potentially. But there's also another version of this argument, or some people will argue in favor of uh, development, uh, development incentives in that they can actually help our economy grow, that they could provide resources to business that could be crucial in helping new businesses get started or um, existing businesses to grow to a level that they couldn't otherwise, right? That's exactly right. You know, we can kind of think about it as, as also an opportunity to, you know, pr pr to um, create sort of an incubator, right, if you mm -hmm. will. There were the, we can use these development incentives to, to act as sort of that, that, that seed, that startup seed money or, or investment um, for, for businesses and individuals to then go out and, and try their new ideas and to you know, ultimately you know, act in entrepreneurial manners and to try to you know, provide those things that you and I want and, and ultimately then thereby uh, uh, result in, in economic growth and development. And a part of this uh, element is specifically, a part of this argument for economic growth would specifically target entrepreneurship and, and suggest that states and, and local governments could have a, a particularly valuable role to play in helping provide funding to entrepreneurs to, who are trying to, to get set up or uh, trying to, to grow their businesses, right? That's exactly right. Again, just provide another avenue and another opportunity to to, to get that, that, that startup capital and that, that seed money that you know, might not otherwise be available to these individuals who, who could then, you know, who, who do have legitimate, potentially legitimate and viable uh, ideas about what it is that they can, they can produce and, and, and ultimately how it is that they can you know, go about um, you know, changing the trajectory of the future and, and creating those things that you and I want. Yeah, that's, that's very much a, a big part of the argument. And in fact, with, with many of these incentive deals and, and incentive programs that exist in states, um, when you do look across many states, pretty much all of them, you know, a big, a big component of this puzzle is to really uh, help explicitly spur 
uh, entrepreneurial growth and entrepreneurial activity. And, and many times when a, a small business in, in a state becomes a big business, I mean, as we saw before with Amazon, I mean, that, that, that leads to a lot of uh, job growth and, and a lot of just a economic uh, benefits because the, you get a company that is creating value in our economy and it happens to locate in your state. And so there are a lot of good jobs that are tied to this value creating activity and they're located in Alabama, say, as opposed to someplace else, right? Uh, that's exactly right. You get the job growth that comes along with it. You get the incomes that come along with it. You get all of the ancillary opportunities that come along with it. Think about you know all of the all of the businesses that that grow and develop around Amazon and what it is that Amazon does. You know that comes along too. And you know for state or local government, there's obviously additional tax revenue, which then can be turned into you know I important uh, publicly provided goods. You know whether it be additional funding for schools or roads or Whatever it might be, you know those those revenues are also available that otherwise wouldn't be available. Now, we don't. Uh, this is a topic that's not directly relevant to what we're getting at today. But there is a whole question. That there's plenty of sources of, of uh, funding available to uh, entrepreneurs in the in the marketplace, uh, whether it be through venture capitalists, uh, you know, is probably best represented by the, the, the folks on Shark Tank, mm -hmm. or through loans from business, from banks, or, uh, you know, if a company gets a little bit bigger, they could issue stock. So there are lots of ways that money can be available in the, uh, in, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the investors on Shark Tank will invest in a company if they think it has prospects for growth and, and profitability. So. One issue, if, if we're going to think that state governments can help uh, provide funding in a useful and beneficial fashion, would be that there must be some argument in here that somehow like the Shark Tank funding or these private sector, or these sources of private funding wouldn't be providing enough funding, right? I think that's part of it. And I think that you know, an, another way to, to look at this is, and it's probably also part of the argument uh, regarding you know, why it is that these incentives are used in such a manner is that you know, is it possible that you know these incentives can be used in a way that would mimic private capital mm -hmm. markets? Because if that's the case, then what this would allow for uh, is simply just another avenue and another opportunity for you know would-be entrepreneurs to to go out and and seek this funding that you know quite possibly they might not be able to obtain uh, elsewhere. So it's really about just kind of providing. At least I think that's what a big part of the argument is: just providing that additional opportunity and that additional outlet um, for, for individuals to, to pursue. Now again, that, that does bring up a relevant question, which is, is it possible then um, for you know, these state and local agencies and these state and local funds to actually be allocated in a manner that would mimic private mm -hmm. venture markets, venture capital markets or not? And that's, that's a relevant question. Yeah, and that's the one where it's not really what we want to get into here today. It would be a topic for an entire uh, show on its own. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, we were talking about targeted development incentives, and I do want to contrast that with a, a strategy which I think a, a lot of economists, especially if they, they favor economic freedom, would recommend to, to state and local governments, and that is you know, perhaps across the board tax cuts. And, and so we do want to make sure that what we're talking about here is a, a very more targeted, uh, you make a deal with a specific company as opposed to just like what Tennessee did when they uh, eliminated their income tax altogether, right? Yeah, and you know that's another part of the issue too, and something that uh, you know a number of economists have brought up, which is, you know, when you begin just randomly or ra targeting and 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 selecting, you know, individual businesses or individual firms to receive these benefits, well, obviously that leaves other businesses in in the state or in the local community at a competitive disadvantage, mm -hmm. right? So I think that you know there is a pretty strong argument to be made, an argument that a number of economists have ha have made that. If you are going to have development incentives, um, to the extent that you're going to have them, then what you probably want to see are incentives that are just blanket incentives available to anyone and everyone um, out there trying to, to seek these opportunities and to make it then that way at least a bit more of a level playing field as opposed to just picking and choosing. Now, we want to get into to your research here, but before we do, uh, the question of whether uh, development incentives have spurred job creation and economic growth is one that a number of economists ha have investigated mm -hmm. uh, already. And, and so what have they found? 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, I mean, it, it depends on, you know, what specifically is being looked at, you know, time frame and things like that. But, you know, in general, there isn't a lot of evidence that, you know, it's going to lead to massive job growth, especially relative to the cost. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, that's that's not, you know, completely true, right? There are, there are some papers and some research that has showed that, yeah, given a particular industry or a particular area, it may lead to job growth and things like that. But again, I think that, you know, kind of the broad overarching question is, you know, at what cost? That's a very big one. And, and typically, you know, these, these uh, uh, incentive packages do become very expensive, mm -hmm. right, ultimately to taxpayers, um, especially on a, on a per job created basis, right? So, you know, some of these, some of these uh, um, incentives of, you know, per jobs, right, it's, you know, literally six figures, right? So mm -hmm. we're talking a couple hundred thousand dollars, right, per job created is what it ultimately cost. Well, again, those are real resources that, that could be used for anything else that are now being tied up into very uh, 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 high cost job creation. Now, so, that, so that's the part of this question that economists, that a number of economic studies have investigated. What hasn't been studied as much is the link between uh, these development incentives and uh, entrepreneurship per se, right? Yeah, exactly, and that's really kind of you know where the question that that, that I wanted to, to look at comes into play. Again, given that you know a, a big part of these development incentives is to try to spur entrepreneurial activity. Well, my question really was and, and is you know to what extent is that true? You know, how much does it actually affect entrepreneurial activity? And another question. Uh, that you take up is also the question of whether we're going to get the right kind of entrepreneurship. And, and to get and to talk about what you mean by that, we need to think a little bit about uh, how entrepreneurship that we've said was so vital and important for a growing economy could also perhaps be less productive or un unproductive. And uh, for this, I uh, want to go back to a, a comment from, uh, from Adam Smith uh, back in The Wealth of Nations about how it is that uh, business leaders rarely get together, even for merriment and diversion, where the cons uh, conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Just showing that you know, there's two sides to the idea of, of trying to help business, or there are ways that business uh, business leaders or entrepreneurs might go about trying to boost their business that doesn't necessarily lead to economic growth, right? Yeah, that's exactly right, and I think that Adam Smith probably sums it up best in that you know there there are those productive kinds of entrepreneurship, right, which which ultimately does lead to economic growth and development by producing those new innovations and creating those new things that you and I ultimately want. But then there's another aspect to entrepreneurship, which is uh, to effectively divert scarce um, resources uh, toward that individual or that group. Right at the expense of everybody else, and that ultimately is not growth enhancing in any way. It, at best, it's it's just a transfer of resources, but we're not actually growing the economy at all. And we talked a little bit about some of the economists who talk about the, the positive elements of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and how they're so important. Uh, another economist, more recently, was a, a got credit for sort of introducing this whole idea of unproductive or destructive entrepreneurship into the, the uh, mm -hmm. literature. So tell us about this. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, Bill Balmol, um, who really tried to dive into, you know, the different aspects of entrepreneurship, right? Because for him, the, the stock of entrepreneurship is no different, right? Mm -hmm. every, every place has just the same number of entrepreneurs. What really matters are the institutions that exist and the institutional environment that exists. So what, are, what, are, what, are the, what does the legal regime look like? What do the laws look like? All of those things, because those are the things that will ultimately incentivize individuals to either pursue those productive entrepreneurial opportunities that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. or to pursue those unproductive entrepreneurial opportunities, which is effectively lobbying and, and rent seeking and things like that, trying to divert those scarce resources back to those individual entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and ultimately doing nothing as far as you know, actually creating uh, economic growth and, and prosperity in the long run. And it's, it's really sort of entrepreneurship comes down to the talent, that creativity, and imagination, intelligence, and, and just whether it's going to be put to good purposes or, or destructive, uh, I guess, privately, uh, privately rewarding, but not uh, socially beneficial mm -hmm. uses, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's exactly right. 
and that, that's the role of the institutional structure. Exactly. Now, so you have this idea. Well, this whole idea of unproductive entrepreneurship still could be a little uh, maybe abstract or, or, or can you make it a little more concrete? What would be a really good example you might think of, like, say, unproductive entrepreneurship here? Yeah, you know, I think this is something that we were just talking about, but you can think about sports stadiums as being a really good example of that. We've seen more and more, especially in the recent past, where you know you have these major sports teams out there and they, they want a new stadium, so what do they do? Well, you know, they go to the, the state government or the local government and, and get those those groups and those entities to divert lots of resources, lots of taxpayer dollars and everything else uh, to to that that uh, organization, right? Um, sometimes right through eminent domain, right, uh, allowing that 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 uh, sports team to expand, uh, um, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And those are those are taking those real resources away from other functions, right? Actually spending scarce time and resources trying to obtain them to begin with. There's nothing about that that's actually growth enhancing, right, in any sort of economic sense. We're just transferring resources. There's no real productive entrepreneurship there. So now it comes down to, you know, you've, you've told us what you were trying to get at. Now to do economic research, then you know, we often build on the work of others. And you're, you're able to, in this research, uh, build on the work of two other economists who had already put together some things that you could use to measure these ideas uh, of Productive and unproductive entrepreneurship, and then also the uh, incentive environment. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so, tell us first about this: uh, how we might be able to measure uh, unproductive versus productive entrepreneurship. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, former former professor of mine, Russ Sobel, uh, he actually has a paper trying to look at uh, Baumol's implications about productive and unproductive entrepreneurship. So he developed actual measures of you know what productive entrepreneurship might be and unproductive entrepreneurship might be I think we have up here uh, and then uh, ultimately you know he looked at it in the sense of net entrepreneurial productivity which mm -hmm. is just the difference between the two but thinking about you know venture capital investment in the state patents self-employment firm births and then unproductive being the amount of lobbying that's going on the number of political organizations legal quality things of that nature mm -hmm. right so I just took that measure and then tried to apply that to uh, another uh, uh, measure of you know the overall incentive environment uh, that exists within a state. So let's talk about that. Uh, mm -hmm. The other component, I guess, the other part of the scissors here, or the other uh, uh, um, empirical measure you're able to yeah, use exactly, to get at this. Yeah, exactly. The incentives environment index, right? Mm -hmm. And all that does is just basically look at how hard or easy is it for a state and local government to actually provide. Uh, um, incentives uh, to um, um, a business or a firm trying to to locate within a state or or a local jurisdiction so just looking at those constraints and this is important because uh, if you go back some number of years uh, many states had provisions in their uh, state constitutions that would have prohibited uh, some of these things like uh, Alabama had a uh, provision in the state constitution we had to pass an amendment to get rid of that constitution to allow uh, this, uh, both the state and local governments to make expenditures to, uh, that mm -hmm. would directly benefit uh, private businesses, right? Yeah, exactly. That's something that goes back to really the 1830s, 1840s, where a number of states, you know, imposed constraints that that specifically prohibited state and local governments from taking public money and, and taxpayer money and and actually using it uh, to benefit private individuals. That was explicitly prohibited, and just like you said, that's something that. You know, over time, these constraints have have been relaxed across many states, and mm -hmm. as a result of that, you know, that's really where we've seen this growth in, in development incentives come from, um, really across all states. So now you have these uh, two different measures: one way to measure entrepreneurship, productive and unproductive, mm -hmm. and then one way to measure the, uh, the incentives environment. And then you, you know, I guess it's just a matter of putting them together and see how they uh, correlate, right? And that's exactly right. And so let's see. Hopefully. We'll We'll get, get ahead and take a look at the uh, what you found. Here we go. Yeah, and so here all we're looking at is just again thinking about that that uh, incentive environment index, right? Where basically what this is showing here is as it becomes easier, right, for state and local governments to to invest in in, in entrepreneurial activities and provide these incentives, what that does is actually right it correlates very strongly 
with uh, uh, ne in negatively with productive entrepreneurship. So mm -hmm. what does this mean? If it's easier for these development incentives to be used, there's actually less productive entrepreneurship that occurs within a given state. So fewer things like patents and, and new businesses uh, exactly. being, being formed. Exactly. And then how about with uh, unproductive? On the flip side, right, where we see it's easier to provide these development incentives, we see a significant increase in unproductive entrepreneurship. So we see more lobbying and more rent seeking, right, lower quality legal environment, things of that nature. And then if uh, this net uh, entrepreneurship is just the productive part minus the unproductive part, exactly. well, we, we can already guess what the, the, to the answer is going to be for net entrepreneurship. Right? Exactly. Net entrepreneurial formation declines significantly as it becomes easier to provide these development incentives. So this might seem like, like really good evidence or really strong evidence, but uh, f for economists, uh, we would raise some problem or we would raise some questions here when you're just looking at uh, correlations or, mm -hmm. or associations between two variables. And so, tell us a little bit about how you then do we have to do like econometrics to try to roll other explanations for this, right? Yeah. So econometrics, you can kind of think about as just really being you know applied statistics, right? And mm -hmm. Applied statistical analysis. So, you know, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is as economists, when we look at any sort of data, is you know, just, just recreate kind of a, a natural experiment and get a, get a random sample, right? Well, for, for economists, it's, it's really hard to get a random sample to, to make that, that natural experiment occur. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to be able to control, right, for all of those other possible explanations for what it is that might be causing here uh, productive entrepreneurship or unproductive entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So what I also did, right, which we don't, we don't show here, but um, I also tried to think about all of the different things, all the different factors and variables that could also influence productive entrepreneurship and unproductive entrepreneurship, right, in order to really try to tease out as best I can the causal relationship mm -hmm. between this, these, these uh, um, 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 in incentives, right, these, these, these state and local incentives and both productive and unproductive entrepreneurship. And importantly, right, what, I, what I've shown and been able to find is even after controlling for all of these things, the relationship still stands. Well, okay, great. So then, you know, I guess then, given that this uh, re, you know, relationship is, uh, does hold up, uh, what does this mean for our policy or how we should be thinking about what's, what states are doing with uh, these development incentives? Well, I think, you know, I mean, an interesting implication is when you look at it, you know, again, a lot of times state and local governments talk about one of the big functions for, for these development incentives is to really spur and grow entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial activity. And on the face of it, looking at the results that I have and what I've found, it would appear that this is actually true. It, it does lead to entrepreneurship, but it leads to a certain type of entrepreneurship, which is the unproductive type, the type mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily lead to economic growth and development. Right? So what this means then is you know, we need to really start radically rethinking how it is that we evaluate and try to apply these development incentives to ensure that if we're going to use them, we want to make sure that they aren't actually resulting in this unproductive entrepreneurship. We want it to be the productive kind. Um, now again, that's much easier said than done because there's there's a real incentive, right? Once you sit there and start using these things, right? Especially through the political process, for entrepreneurs to start to game that system, mm -hmm. right? And and that's really where we start to see this rise in things like crony capitalism. And I guess another concern would be, I mean, if once you get entrepreneurs thinking of or, or needing to talk to the government or work with the government to get develop to get targeted uh, tax breaks, then they, they might uh, start to work the system or game the system to get other types of benefits as well, right? As that, opposed to benefiting that, consumers. That's exactly right. Well, thanks for coming on and talking about this. This is, uh, I think, really um, important and relevant uh, research. And uh, you know, I think uh, we've learned a lot from your, your work here. So thanks for coming on and talking about this. Thank you. Thank you again. And thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.